questions. I want to make sure folks have an opportunity to ask you questions, but what I would ask is, as Chris did with all of his uh, time last year, uh, type the question in the chat box and we'll collect them up at a at maybe a, a point of, uh, of uh, uh, where, where, where it's good for Lucas to take a few rather than, you know, uh, interrupt him as we go along. So uh, if you do have questions, just type them in the chat room and uh, and Derby and I'll kind of bookkeep those and make sure we, we, we give you an opportunity to ask it. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, well, thank you so much for our, uh, having me or inviting me to talk here. It's, it's a great pleasure. Um, I've been, as I was saying when, when we were chatting before, I haven't done a public talk in a little while now. My last one was a couple years ago on Maui, and it's pretty exciting that we're able to do this sort of stuff, you know, virtually uh, at this point. Um, so Paul already told you a little bit about myself. Uh, I now, I'm an assistant astronomer at the National Solar Observatory and I'm based out of Maui, uh, but the National Solar Observatory itself is really based in Boulder. We have some facilities at some various places around the country. Um, and one of them is here because this is where our new telescope is. So it's, I'm really lucky to be out here, uh, to be able to study the sun and to be able to work with a brand new instrument or well, a suite of new instruments in a brand new facility. Um, the National Solar Observatory, I thought I'd tell you a little bit about what it is and what it does. It's, it's funded directly through the National Science Foundation um, and is operated by the Associated Universities for Research and Astronomy, uh, Aura, and they operate many uh, observatories uh, for the NSF. NSO is one of them. And NSO kind of has two separate missions that it does. Um, the first is the Integrated Synoptic Program, or NISP. And this is a collection of satellites that are spread all over the world. There's one uh, next door to me uh, on the Big Island of Hawaii. There's another in Big Bear, California, outside of LA, uh, down in Chile, and then up at Tenerife in the Canary Islands over in India, and then uh, the final station is down in Australia. And this uh, whole collection of telescopes basically provides 24 seven coverage of the sun from the ground. Um, and it's, it's really useful for constant synoptic uh, observations of the sun and a lot of modeling that goes, uh, that is based off of those. And that's really useful for detecting things like space weather, solar flares, uh, what are called coronal mass ejections, uh, things that affect satellite communications and stuff like that. The other big project that it has is, is the one that I work on, DECAS, the Daniel K. Noe Solar Telescope. And that's just up the hill from me, about, oh, back in that direction, maybe 10 miles <laughs> up. <laughs> well, not 10 miles up, but 10 miles back. Um, and it's the new flagship uh, telescope of, of the solar physics community. Um, this is showing it in, uh, in construction during a number of years ago, right after they were using this big crane to put the, the, the dome on top, the, the enclosure. Um, so what is DKIST? It's the world's largest dedicated solar telescope. It's obviously not the largest telescope. Uh, the heart of it is this four meter primary mirror. Uh, here showing it um, not at the DECAS facility, but across the parking lot at, at the Air Force's facility where the final coating was put on it. Um, so this is in the coating uh, or outside of the coating chamber. Um, it's, it's, a really, uh, it's a really nice, <laughs> it's a really nice mirror. It's a really nice optic and it's designed uh, specifically for solar observations, which comes with its own, own set of challenges. Um, the telescope itself uh, sits up at the top of Haleakala. Um, and it's, as I said, it's this larger uh, facility here that has recently been constructed uh, and is just starting its first operations. Uh, you can see here, there's a couple other telescopes at this site as well. These are the 1.8 meter pan stars. Uh, telescopes. You might recognize them. They made a splash a couple of years ago uh, because they detected the first object that we've ever seen that came from outside of the solar system. This was the uh, Oumuamua 
or the, the traveler that shows up first is, is roughly translated, I guess, what that means in, uh, in Hawaiian language. Um, you can see a couple of properties of, of the site itself right here. It's, we're really up quite high. It's at 10,000 feet, and it's uh, very abrupt and steep to go down to the ocean, especially on the back side here. From the, from the telescope, from standing on one of these rocks over here at the base of the telescope, you see all the way down to the ocean. And it, it looks like you're about to just fall off a cliff and roll down the hill. <laughs> it's, a, it's a really wonderful sight. Um, this is kind of what cuts away inside the telescope and gives you a sense of, of what the optics are. Um, as I said, this mirror is a four meter fast F2 primary mirror. Uh, it sits right here, and it has uh, a rather special design. It's an off-axis Gregorian. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Um, the enclosure has a lot. It has a lot of hardware that goes into it itself. There's a lot of thermal systems that uh, allow for active cooling of the optics and the, and temperature control of the entire telescope structure. It has multiple different buildings. There's an operations building. There's also uh, a separate building that's not shown here off to the side that handles all of the cooling. Basically, you make ice at night and then you use all that when the, when the electricity is cheap <laughs> and then you use all that ice during the, during the day to, to provide your heat sink for the cooling. Um, there, it's actually really three separate structures and this is in order to reduce vibration. So the entire inside of the enclosure there's a whole barrier. There's stairwells and there's little gaps on both sides of the stairwells where there's no actual mechanical coupling from the inside shell to the outside shell. And this is to do, this is to dampen vibrations throughout the entire structure. Uh, so the light comes in and bounces around and heads down several floors uh, to where all the instruments actually sit. As I said, the design of the telescope is off-axis. In a, in a typical Gregorian on-axis telescope, your light comes in, bounces off your primary mirror, comes back up to your secondary mirror, and then heads on down to eyepieces or instruments or whatever you put on the other side. Uh, with the off-axis design, like DKIST, the light comes in, bounces off the primary mirror, but is redirected at an angle up to the secondary assembly where it then goes uh, down to the rest of the optical system. There's a really good reason for that in solar physics. Um, this shows the inside of the dome. This is an actual, you know, the actual picture. Here shows the primary optics. Here shows where that M2 mirror is, which is then bounced down and bounces around in here before going down to the rest of the rest of the instruments. Um, and what having an off-axis design does is it gets all of this structure, cable wraps, uh, all of the support structure to hold the heat stop out of the way of the light path and it reduces the scattered light. This ends up being very important because one of the things that DECUS is designed to do is to image not just the solar disk, but the atmosphere of the sun. And if you have a lot of that scattered light off of all of this telescope structure, then you're no longer able to perform those very, very uh, faint observations. So that's drove the design of this telescope. Um, just as a sense of scale, you can see a couple of, of people back here, a couple of the engineers um, or construction workers at DKIST. It's also readily apparent that like most major facilities, it kind of looks very industrial, right? There's this huge crane that sits right here. This is to take the primary mirror off and send it down outside of the facility across the road so you can recoat the optics occasionally or clean it. Um, there's also all of these pipes up here. This is to get cooling systems, which is basically the coolant that is used as a form of salt water, the high heat capacity because there's about 14 kilowatts of power that gets concentrated at the, at the focus, at the, at the secondary mirror here. As far as where DKIST is, uh, it's at the summit, like I said, of Haleakala, which means House of the Sun in Maui, uh, or in Hawaiian, uh, it's on the island of Maui. This is a really nice image from uh, Jason Chu. Oh, I, I don't know when he took this. He was, I, I believe, a, um, a graduate student at the Institute for Astronomy in Oahu 
I think he now works on the Big Island. Uh, but this is a, a nice, a real nice image. It shows DECUS there, the other facilities. This is the Air Force uh, telescope, uh, PANSTARS, and a couple of the other telescopes as well um, that are, I think, mostly used for educational purposes. Um, you can see the Big Island uh, in the background here. This is looking roughly southeast. Uh, and you can see some of the lights from Kihei all along the coast here. Uh, so all the resorts and stuff are down in this area and around the other side of Maui. Haleakala is a very special location. Um, so this picture is taken from the summit and looks over to the Dicas facility. The crater is off on our left-hand side here. Here's some pictures in the crater, and I want to talk just a little bit about this. It's if you ever get a chance to go to Hawaii, or to go to Maui in, in particular, take the time to go down into Haleakala Crater. It is one of the most beautiful and uh, extraordinary places that you will ever visit. Um, it's one of the quietest places on Earth provided there are no planes flying over at the time. <laughs> um, this shows down into the crater, so the telescope, I believe, is up on our right in this picture. Um, and the first thing that you do when you go into the crater is drop down this incredibly steep 3,000-foot cliff on a section of switchbacks. So you can see part of the trail back here looking up the hill. The crater itself is very unique. It has a lot of unique flora and fauna. Uh, one of these is the Ahina Hina, the silver sword. It grows only in the crater itself. Um, it's, the picture doesn't do it justice. These are incredible plants. Uh, they're this greenish, silvery, vibrant color, uh, and it has all of these little tendrils to suck as much moisture out of the air as it can get, because Haleakala Crater is very, very dry. Um, while at the same time reflecting as much sunlight as possible uh, in order to, to not dry out. And it only ever blooms once in its life and then it dies. Uh, and if you ever catch it during when these are blooming, it's really, they're really extraordinary plants. Um, there's also things like the Hawaiian petrel, uh, which are, are quite, quite wonderful and just a, Final thing that I want to mention is that you can actually stay in the crater. You can camp in here. There's a series of sort, uh, forest service cabins that you can rent through the National Park Association. So if you ever want to do like astrophotography, this is a really good place to go because you get a cabin and everything. You have to book it six months in advance and it fills up very quickly. Um, when I was staying out there uh, around 4th of July several years ago, I, uh, I was going to sleep in one of the cabins and I heard this just absolute cacophony outside and I went outside and was looking around by the starlight and it turns out that behind one of the cabins is the cliff sides where these Hawaiian petrels nest and they're incredibly chatty and noisy birds so I should say that Haleakala Crater is the quietest place on earth unless the petrels are currently nesting and, and giving birth to their and the egg or the the um you know, the, the, the babies are currently hatching, in which case it's just a cacophony of sound at night. It was a really, really unique experience. Uh, looking back in the other direction, so all the images I just showed you were kind of like right on the other side of this hill. Dicus is situated right there. And a big reason why we put the telescope on Haleakala is really illustrated by, by this image. I took this photo uh, flying in on New Year's Eve a number of years ago, and it shows this really strong inversion layer uh, right here. So the Big Island is southish, going in that direction. To the north, over to the left is Oahu. Um, and this inversion layer uh, shows up very often and develops very often in uh, Haleakala. Um, and it makes for this really nice scattering free, like low scattered light coronal skies. We call them coronal skies because you can actually image the corona uh, and take measurements uh, from the site there. What instruments does DECUS have? Um, well, it has five first light instruments that will are coming online uh, slowly over the, the course of the next uh, next several months and maybe a year. There's been some delays due to COVID uh, pandemic. Unfortunately, the entire construction effort was shut down for many months uh, and then has continued since around 
July, I think, at a, at a slower pace uh, in order to keep different groups of engineers uh, separated so to prevent the, the risk of outbreak. Um, but the first flight instruments uh, are combinations of imagers. Uh, they take spectra. Uh, they take polarized spectra uh, for a variety of reasons. And they're able to take um, data of the sun both on the solar disk at numerous layers throughout the solar atmosphere and off limb. So the light distribution system is pretty interesting itself. Uh, so the light comes down into the sun, bounces off M1 and M2, goes through a couple other mirrors, three, four, and five, before and six, before getting kicked down into the platform where all the instruments live. From there, the, the, uh, the facility uh, distribution optics um, give the light to each of the instruments. And you can see this shows on the left, uh, shows the crude rotator, uh, a picture of that with all of the optical beams. Cryoners that show in here, it's uh, roughly the size and shape of a coffin, <laughs> uh, surprisingly enough. Um, and there's also polarization, calibration optics, and a lot of uh, beam splitters to redirect the light around, pick off small wavelengths of light and ship them off to other instruments. So what does the actual data from this uh, telescope and these various instruments look like? I'm sure many of you have, have seen this. Uh, hopefully these, this was the first light calibration images uh, or commissioning images that were taken about a year ago. Uh, they were taken December and released last January. All of the DKIS instruments are really focused on small, high resolution regions of patches of the sun. So this shows an image of the sun. Uh, there's actual granulation on that. This shows roughly the region that we're looking at here. Um, this was taken with the visible broadband imager. Uh, I believe this is around 500 nanometers in light. The scale here, is about uh, 24,000 miles, about three Earths in one direction. And let's just take a look at the movie. This is about 10 minutes of data, and you can see the top of the convection zone as the sun. So this is like a boiling pot of water. This is plasma. It's about 6,000, 5,000 degrees Kelvin. Um, and you can see a lot of fine structure and fine dynamics. This is the type of stuff that we're interested in. The bright regions that are roughly circular-ish, maybe hexagonal, those are the, the upwelling bubbles of plasma. The dark regions that surround them are all the plasma after it rises up. It releases a lot of its light, that's what we see, and then it cools, condenses, and drops back down. So the stuff that's bright here is really flowing up from the surface and the dark things are penetrating back down into the, into the interior of the sun. The really bright patches that you see at some of these boundaries are strong concentrations of magnetic field. And those are getting jostled around and moved around and twisted and distorted. And that actually sends a lot of energy up into the atmosphere of the sun. And this is something that we're really going to target with a lot of our observations. Um, so this is just the commissioning data. This isn't even scientific data yet. This is only from a single instrument uh, of which we have quite a few. Uh, well, we have five. <laughs> um, we can look at some other types of images. This is roughly the same scale. This is the very first sunspot uh, that's ever been that was imaged with, um, with the solar telescope. This is actually not even from one of the uh, scientific instruments. This is from the adaptive optic system. So this system corrects for all of the aberration of light coming through our turbulent, through Earth's turbulent atmosphere. And this is actually a movie. And there's a lot of even interesting dynamics that you can see in here. It's, it's a little hard to, to see, you have to, pick one object and really focus on it and see that it evolves over this very short time sequence of just about a minute. Um, but it does evolve and you see these little uh, features that are right at the resolution of the telescope at about um, 
20 kilometers on the sun. Uh, so this is, again, a lot of what we're going to look at in the future. Um, and this is only really the very first images that we're able to get. Again, you can see the sort of rotation of some of these, uh, some of the structures surrounding the sunspot. Uh, also uh, visible in this, you can see around the sunspot is the regular granulation pattern. The sunspots themselves are very strong concentrations of the magnetic field, about a tenth of a Tesla. It's very strong on the sun. And it suppresses, the, the, the strength of that magnetic field is so strong that it suppresses the convection of the sun itself, uh, uh, which prevents heat from getting into the sunspot area. And that's why it lowers its temperature and appears dark in visible light anyways. So, um, many, those are, so these are examples of the imaging capabilities of, of DKIST. We're also going to be focused a lot on the, why can I not move to the next slide? Here we go. Uh, a lot on the, uh, the different wavelengths of light um, with DKIST. That's what most of the instruments are designed to look at. Um, so Isaac Newton knew about the dispersive nature of prisms. Uh, so here's uh, one nice old painting uh, uh, that shows a pinhole redirecting sunlight through a prism and being spread out into, you know, the, the spectra, the solar spectrum, the colors of the rainbow here. Um, around the same time, James Gregory discovered that if you take a feather and you hold it up to the sun, you can diffract the light into its constituent colors as well. This is basically how a diffraction grading works. Um, scientists during, during this period, you know, got better and better techniques to split up the wavelengths of light from the sun. Uh, and in 1814, uh, Joseph Fraunhofer produced the first uh, high resolution spectrum of the solar spectrum. So if you took this sunlight, passed it through uh, a diffraction grading, and split it out like this, what you see is the solar, the solar spectrum, all the colors split out, but you also see these dark bands. These are the Fraunhofer lines. Uh, as many of you probably know, these uh, are indications of the different elements that exist on the sun. There's calcium, hydrogen, iron, magnesium, sodium, carbon, there's even some molecules, O2, uh, there's, there's, some, there's quite a few other molecules. You can see many, many lines in here. These are particularly interesting for uh, solar astronomers uh, because let's suppose now that instead of taking all of the light from the entire sun integrated, we just took it from one little spatial patch on the sun. That's gonna look something like this. This is older data, I believe taken with, uh, with an instrument at the Dunn Solar Telescope, or actually this might be SDO. I'll show other, I'll show another sunspot in a second. But imagine we had an image of a sunspot like this, and we took just a small slit of light uh, from the middle of it, and took that out and pushed it into the solar spectrum. We'd see something like this. Uh, so you can see the dark spot here gets spread into this dark patch that goes through all the wavelengths of light. And you have some sort of variation uh, away from that sunspot uh, center. You, you get variations in that intensity in this direction. So this is spatial directions here. And this is the wavelength direction of light here as we split it up into its colors. Now, if we do that uh, with some nice instruments, um, then we get images that look, or data that look something like this. This is the primary science target of a lot of the DKIST instruments. Uh, so here, this is data from the Dunn Solar Telescope. This is the FERS instrument there, which was a Pathfinder mission for the diffraction limited near infrared spectropolarimeter, uh, which is, will be operating in DKIST shortly. Um, so again, in this direction here, we have spatial information from just this single location in the sunspot. And then we've spread out the wavelengths in this direction with bluer wavelengths on the left, redder wavelengths on the right. And now you can see something very interesting when you look at how, this, how these lines uh, change as you pass through a sunspot. Out in these regions, we have a single line. 
these regions right here correspond to where the granulation pattern is and where the penumbra is. But as you start passing into that penumbra, the single line splits into three separate lines. As you go into this dark region here, which is also the dark region right here uh, in the sun, right in the middle of the sunspot, it's fully split into these three separate lines. And as you pass out the other side of the sunspot, they come back together. This happens because of a quantum mechanical effect uh, where if there's a strong magnetic field, it will split up some of these specific Fraunhofer lines into multiple components. And the amount of splitting is, is proportional, basically is a measure of how strong that magnetic field is. If you then take not just the intensity, but you take, look at the polarization of the light, like if you had a set of sunglasses and you rotated it like this, you see that the, the, the light that you see uh, changes in each of these different polarizations. That tells us basically what the orientation of the magnetic field is, whether it's pointed towards you or away from you, or whether it's at some angle relative to your line of sight like this. Uh, and these are the diagnostics that we use to, to map out the magnetic structure of the sun. So when we do that over the entire solar surface, uh, we get things that look like this. This is actually just visible light image um, right here that shows the full sun in, in like if you had a neutral density filter to, uh, to block off most of the light so you can look at it through your telescope, you can see something that looks like this. Sunspot clusters here and a lot of nothing <laughs> everywhere else. But if you now look at it in that polarized light, and map that to how strong the magnetic field is everywhere on the solar surface, you see something that looks like this. I should say these are all images from a satellite mission, a NASA satellite mission, the Solar Dynamics Observatory. And here you can see that where the sunspots are, you have strong concentrations of magnetic field that actually extend well beyond the, the outer edge of the sunspot. But you can also see a lot of sort of salt and pepper magnetic field sprinkled everywhere throughout the rest of the sun. As you move and look in different wavelengths of light, you can see this at different, different levels of the atmosphere of the sun. This shows it in hydrogen alpha, uh, and you see a lot of other phenomena here, including these prominences that extend well off the, the outside edge of the sun. So this is where we're seeing you know, the sun is not this static object. It has this extended atmosphere that extends out above that visible surface. Uh, a lot of the instruments that we'll be looking at uh, with DKIS will be focused up on these higher regions of the solar atmosphere. In UV and EUV wavelengths, we really see a lot of this structure. All of this is very hot plasma. We won't observe this directly with DKIST, we will observe similar things in the infrared. Um, I don't have any images of that. We don't have any infrared data from the sun yet, but we have very, very limited historical infrared data from the sun in the infrared. But you can get similar diagnostics in the infrared. Uh, and that was a big reason in designing that off-axis design of the telescope to reduce the scattered light. Um, and out in this region, you see a lot of structure. This is all really guided by these strong concentrations of the magnetic field right at the surface, the photosphere of the sun. Now, if you look even further out in eclipse observations, I, I hope many of you were able to see the eclipse uh, that happened in 2017. Um, and, and there's going to be another one upcoming next year, I believe, um, and, and that passes through the US. Now you see really the extended atmosphere of the sun. So I've shrunk the scale here. This, you know, this radius is now the same as this radius for the eclipse image. Um, and you can see this extended atmosphere that it stretches from the sun, from the solar surface, way out and forms the solar wind. Really, we live in the atmosphere of the sun. Uh, and that's, again, a big aspect of what we're going to try and study with DKIST. Uh, DECAS will focus really on this inner region out to, oh, about there is about as far away as you can point the telescope off the sun before you get a reflection from that primary mirror that starts melting things inside the telescope dome. <laughs> so it's important not to, you know, there are constraints to where you can point at, uh, point 
uh, the DECAS telescope because it's those focusing optics of something as bright as the sun. So we're going to study this large scale structure of the solar atmosphere. And we're also going to study this very, very fine scale structure lower in. This is another um, set of data. This is data that I took uh, from a couple of years ago in 2017 from another instrument, uh, from another telescope that was operated by NSO, the Dunn Solar Telescope. Again, this is the telescope that DKIS now supersedes. I took this with the IBIS instrument, which is a precursor to the VTF instrument, which again it, uh, is the new instrument, upgraded instrument that will be operating at DCAST. Uh, and even at the very smallest scales that we're able to see back then, um, you can see again, lots of dynamics. This is all determined by really what the magnetic field is doing and how it is structuring the plasma that, is, uh, that exists at the solar surface. Uh, so again, this is a, a, another type of observation that we'll be taking. You can see a lot of things going on in this. One, a lot of atmospheric wobbling. <laughs> uh, this was not a particularly good observing day uh, when I took this data. Um, but you can see a lot of wave motion. You can see these little tendrils waving around. Uh, and this tells us a lot about the temperature of the sun, the, the type of dynamics that can happen, the type of waves that the atmosphere uh, supports. Um, and how that, inf how that energy from all this churning convection we saw in that first movie of the granulation pattern makes it further and further up into the solar atmosphere. And then of course, that all translates out to these larger, very large scale dynamical process. Um, this is data from the AIA instrument at SDO um, and shows a, a large scale eruption uh, I can't remember which channel this is. I think I made this movie. <laughs> um, but uh, I, I believe this is, is uh, I believe this is iron nine. Um, it's about a million degree uh, Kelvin. But what you can see happening, oops, what you can see happening here, it's a large scale eruption going off and creating this big, broad, sweep of changes throughout the entire solar atmosphere over the course of about a day and a half. Um, so these are the types of phenomena that we're going to study. DECAS is going to study these very small, detailed, localized patches of, of, of the sun uh, to really try and understand the physics behind um, the, the large scale and the small scale phenomena that we see. Uh, so with that, I guess I just want to say that we're in a really exciting time. We haven't taken science data with the, uh, with the DECAS facility yet, but we're well on our way through the commissioning process. We have already demonstration of the adaptive optic system being able to take out the, the effects of Earth's atmosphere uh, and really see some extraordinary uh, uh, new phenomena on the sun. Uh, so with that, mahalo for listening. Uh, thank you very much. And please, any questions, I'm happy to answer. Yeah, super. Thank, thank you, uh, Luke. Uh, just before I forget, just just on that one satellite image you had, did what did we learn from the? Did you learn from the Parker probe anything that is applied to to what you're going to be doing on the observatory? Or yes. Um, so the Parker Solar Probe saw. Oh, let me see if I can get the video back up. There it is. <laughs> um, the, oh, there we go. Uh, the Parker Solar Probe uh, saw a lot of very interesting structure in the solar wind. Uh, one of the things that it saw was very rapid oscillations in the magnetic field. This is where the magnetic field points at you then points away from you, and then points at you, and then points away from you, and points at you over and over again, very, very rapidly. Um, those are thought, there's a couple of possibilities for how that happens. And it's thought that it happens by some of the processes that, that very tiny scale churning low down in the atmosphere is one way where you could get that sort of phenomena that makes it all the way out into the solar wind. Um, so, so yes, that's, that's uh, one aspect there. 
you see a lot of other things in the Parker data. Um, the elemental composition of the solar wind changes based on what type of solar wind you're in. It's not a smooth, continuous outflow. It has all of this wrinkle and, and structure to it. And those different changes in the number of elements, the amount of iron relative, well, the amount of oxygen relative to the amount of helium changes. And those changes, again, come from very, very small patches on the sun. So understanding those small patches and how that connects out into the solar wind is one of the main one of the main things we're going to study. Okay, cool. Thanks. Uh, let me go back to um, let me scroll up here and see. I know we had several posted. Uh, I want to give folks a chance to. Uh, so John, you had I think a couple questions. Uh, if you're on still, I'm not sure your last name, John, but. Uh, you had one on nuclear. Yeah, why don't you ask us? I was just wondering, the things that you learn, does any of that cross over to the nuclear fusion uh, research? It does. Um, one of the ways that that uh, connects over is the, the last eruption that I showed um, right here. This is a large scale eruption um, that is thought to be, it's called a CME. Um, actually, this one might not have a CME, but they're very, very similar. <laughs> um, so those are thought to be large twisted tubes of magnetic flux that become a magnetic field that become unstable and erupt. Those are very related to the types of instabilities that prevent us from making a long, you know, a long lasting plasma and a fusion device. So these are very closely related. Uh, things called the torus instability and the kink instability come to play in both of these regimes. So yeah, there's, there's quite a bit of overlap there. And the second one I had was in the images of where you have the north and south pole in the magnetograms, how do you tell which is north and which is south? <laughs> you, you tell that based on the polarization of the light. So you can't do this with linear polarization. You have to do this with circular polarization. Um, and basically, if it's polarized in one direction, then it's pointing towards you. And if polarized in the other direction, it's pointing away from you. <laughs> uh, so, and it gets more complicated than that, depending on where you look, but that's really the basic idea there. It allows you to make these nice maps of what the magnetic field looks like. And if you look at different, different lines in the solar atmosphere, if you look at an iron one line, like uh, six, uh, 6,300 nanometers, um, or, or 630 nanometers rather, that forms very low in the solar atmosphere, right down at that visible surface where all the convection is. If you look at some other wavelengths of light, particularly one calcium-2, out at uh, 850 nanometers, that forms higher up. So you not only get the magnetic field at one height, you get it at multiple heights throughout the atmosphere. And you can kind of build up a full three-dimensional structure of what it looks like. <clears throat> Thank you very okay. much. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Thank John. You. I should have known it was you. I'm sorry. I didn't see your last name. And didn't put two to two together. Uh, Janet, Janet Cook, uh, you had some questions uh, about visit visitors. Uh, you know, do you want to you want to ask your question? Sure. Thanks, Paul. Uh, Lucas, I have a non-technical question for you, or I guess a couple. Are members of the public allowed to visit the observatory on? like on tours, of course not right now, I mean during, during normal times, and if not, can they at least visit the grounds? It, it just looks beautiful and I really enjoyed your photos, thank you. Uh, yes, uh, you, well, I should say, no, uh, you're not really going to be able to take tours of the facility. I think that is eventually going to be, um, I think it's eventually going to be allowed. Uh, Part of the issue is that you, 
you mess up the observations when you walk around. <laughs> like, so you, you can't really do that. And, as, and if we're not taking observations, then, then there's also usually maintenance going on. And, and again, you, you get the idea, it's kind of very industrial. Um, what you can do, you can definitely drive all the way to the summit of Haleakala. And you can, like the nice astrophotography picture that I showed, showed Deacons in the distance, you can go do that. There's a nice hike that goes from the summit all the way down the ridge right behind Dekas. So you can, you can hike along that. It's called Skyline. And you can also hike down into the crater. Highly recommend that you go and do all those things. Sounds good. Yeah. Is that a day? Is that a, uh, that's probably a full day to do, to, to go up and down and do, do a few things on the, uh, on the mountain. Yeah. You wouldn't be able to do Skyline um, and the other things. Okay. Skyline literally goes from 10,000 feet down to like two. Okay. <laughs> and and it, it's, it's a long hike. People typically set up a shuttle car and mm. mountain bike down. Bike, bike down. Yeah, I've heard a lot of folks do that. Yeah. Um, let's see if I'm pronouncing your name wrong. I apologize. Man, Man Junith? Uh, yes, yeah, that's, okay. uh, that's correct, actually. Okay. Thank you. Cool. Uh, you showed one uh, photograph of uh, eclipse photograph wherein we saw the huge uh, atmosphere of the sun going on both directions. Do you think uh, it will extend to the orbit of uh, Mercury and Mercury is bathed in that? Sorry, I think you are muted. Whoops. <laughs> uh, yes, it, it extends beyond Mercury. It extends, it connects all the way out into the solar wind. Uh, no, at some level, um, it ceases to be these very strong styrations and becomes much more like a turbulent flow. If you've ever seen these, uh, you know, if you've ever seen these images of like, laminar very straight laminar flow coming out of a jet engine turning into turbulence it looks kind of like that um nice. it's you have to do a lot of image processing and a lot of background subtraction to really see things that faint that far out into the corona but people have done it i see thank you uh, and my next question was you showed this uh, fraunhofer lines uh, in the spectrum is it possible to quantitate the different elements based on the darkness of those lines in the in the sun uh do you mean to get the elemental abundances right 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 um george is going to be the better person to to ask about how exactly you get elemental abundances he's done a lot of work on this um but i don't it's, it's not really the depth of the line that that tells you that it's other properties um, it is the darkness the darkness of the lines yes well i mean the darker they are the more that and the atomic physics will tell you you can get to the abundances. The abundances you get are photospheric, I think, from this, this analysis. In the corona, the abundances can differ. Yeah. And so, um, in fact, let's see, in the corona, certain elements that, where you can remove the first electron, the first electron is bound by only 10 electron volts or less they uh, are more abundant in the corona than in the photosphere. They, they get carried up by the magnetic field in waves, electromagnetic waves. Um, elements with a very high first ionization potential, or the energy it would take to remove the first electron, like argon, neon, uh, they are about the same in the photosphere and in the, and in the corona. Thank you. This is <laughs> This is one of the solar probes orbiter are really interested in. So this yeah. is a nice example of combined observations from ground base and satellite telescopes. What yeah. we call yeah. physics. Yeah. Uh, hey, Chris Spain, you had a question too. This would be. Yeah, it's kind of a two part. It's like so. I may have missed it, but I, I saw that you had the large mirror. And you can you can take the light from the sun and you can split it to different instruments. But I was wondering, kind of a two-part thing. First of all, how are you measuring magnetic fields with data from a mirror? And then also, um, 
is there anything interesting going on in the sun in the, in the radio spectrum? And is it possible for you guys to study that with the equipment that you have there? Uh, DECUS won't be taking radio observations, so I'll answer the second question first, but quite a few other uh, instruments do focus on that. Uh, there are dedicated solar uh, campaigns for the ALMA uh, instrument, uh, interferometer. So I guess the ALMA collection of radio uh, telescopes. And then there's also the uh, extended Owens Valley uh, laboratory, uh, extended Owens Valley Observatory, which is solar dedicated. Um, for for measuring the magnetic field, uh, yeah, we we basically you have these all reflective mirror optics, but those get fed into spectrographs and diffraction gratings and things like that. So that's how we split up the light in that uh, regard. Um, a lot of the new ways of doing that uh, allow you to get simultaneous spectra and images. Um, one really cool way is with the diffraction limited near uh, a diffraction limited near infrared uh, spectral polarimeter. It works on fiber optics. So you basically have a bundle of say 100 by 100, so about 10,000 fiber, individual fiber optic uh, elements that are take a, a square view of the sun. And then you take those and you split them all apart and you feed them into a single line and you pass that through a spectrograph. And so you get all of the spectral data at the same time, but for a 2D spatial field of view. Um, and that's a very cool instrument. And that's that's the type of thing that will be, that we're, you know, uh, will be coming on shortly at TCAST. That does sound pretty cool, thank you. Okay, cool. Uh, Andrew, Weizen, or Eisenreiber? Andrew still on? Andrew was interested in the resolution of the instrument and uh, how does that translate to temporal step interval for magnetic field measurement? Um, the, so the, the spatial uh, resolution, of course, varies by the wavelength of light that you're looking at. At the very uh, bluest side, our spatial resolution is about 0.01 arc seconds. Uh, which comes out to um, about 20 kilometers projected on the sun. Uh, at the other end, uh, the resolution uh, really comes up to the, the, the size of your spectrograph graph slit, which is going to be something like half an arc second or one arc second on the sun. So it kind of depends. All of the different instruments uh, you know, have different resolutions for that reason, because they're all looking at different wavelengths of light. Uh, there was a second part to that question. Uh, yeah, it was uh, basically how does that translate to temporal step interval for magnetic field measurement? Uh, yeah, so you, it, it depends on which instrument you're using. Some instruments can scan spatially. Some instruments can scan in wavelength space based on how they're they're set up. Um, but and it depends on what sort of sensitivity you want. This is sort of a long-winded way of saying you can you can take a, a nice uh, magnetic field uh, measurements of a 2D field of view that's maybe 50 by 50 arc seconds in a couple seconds if you're going relatively fast, or it might take as long as you know several hours if you really are trying to do coronal observations with deep integrations to get very very tiny signals. In that case, you're not really super interested in high spatial resolution. You're more interested in this four meter primary mirror as a giant light bucket. It turns out we're photon starved, <laughs> even though we're looking at the sun, because we want to do very, very detailed, very, very detailed diagnostics. <laughs> that's that's so, so ironic, huh? Yeah. Um, I had one actually. Uh, I noticed on one of your slides, Lucas, where you kind of showed the building and how it was just kind of laid out. When you have an op center there, are, is that mostly people who are just caretaking the instruments, or do you actually have your your uh, scientists and research up, researchers up there, or is that all done remotely from someplace in Montana? <laughs> so the way that DECUS is going to operate is much like other large nighttime facilities. Uh, scientists will put in a proposal, and then 
people who really know how to operate all the instruments uh, that are NSO staff operators and staff scientists are going to take the observations for people. You know, this is what they do in space all the time, right? This is how Hubble works. This is how James Webb works. And it's that same sort of, um, same sort of, uh, you know, observing strategy is going to be used at DKIST. So there'll be, oh, probably, you know, three or four operators plus technicians of various forms and maintenance up on the, sat up on the summit um, at any given time. Okay. You also have, yeah, you have to do a lot of maintenance and optical maintenance for a, a, yeah. you know, a structure of this size. You know, you need quite a few people involved. Yeah, with all the cryogens and everything too. Yeah. Yes, definitely. Mm -hmm. There's, I, I can't remember how many mi hundreds of miles of like cooling tubing there is, but it's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so we have a few more minutes. Anybody have any uh, any other questions uh, for Lucas? Where does Kitt Peak fall in the realm of of solar instruments now? That that used to be like the the, the main solar telescope, right? Um, many years ago, but the McMath Pierce. Yeah, yeah. Um, yes. So McMath Pierce is shut down. It's mothballed as of a few years ago. Oh, okay. Yeah, the the Dunn Solar Telescope uh, at Sac Peak in New Mexico is still operating. Uh, mm. NSO divested of it, and it is now operated by New Mexico, uh, and it's mostly performing um, sort of synoptic uh, continual observations, as well as it's a great site for instrument development, because you can go in there, unlike DCAS, you can go in there and reconfigure things and change things. It's, it's sort of an open facility yeah. uh, in that regard. Okay. Okay. Lucas, I, I have a question, uh, not directly on the solar physics, but that off-axis fast four-meter primary, who fabricated mm -hmm. that? Do you know? Um, I believe it was at, uh, I believe it was in Tucson. But I, at the Optical Science Center? Yeah, I believe so. Oh, good Lord, I believe so. But, man, if I get this wrong. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> it's should I, I stop recording? <laughs> um, I, I think that's where it was fabricated, but I'm I'm not quite sure. Uh we we got a lot of our other optics from from a variety of different vendors. Uh but these are all every single one of the optics in this system, all the beam splitters, all the mirrors are custom with custom coatings. Um so it's sure. they're huge, like you know. They're, they're like this big and they weigh like a hundred pounds. <laughs> you know, they're, they're really impressive to see. <laughs> Thank you. When was it operational, Lucas? When did you, did I miss the date or? The first light, uh, first commissioning data was taken in December of last year. Okay. Um, these are instruments are being added in a rolling fashion. Uh, so there's <clears throat> on, on sun campaigns, uh, Cryo nurse should have one coming up shortly. Uh, DL nurse should have one coming up shortly. Um, so yeah, it's kind of a rolling right yeah. process. Cool. Anybody yeah. else? Somebody asked how you use adaptive optics in the day. Ah, um, the you have your reference your lock point are features on the solar surface it's a little bit different than adaptive optics at night um uh and i think it's a little bit more complicated you have to do a lot of fourier transforms <laughs> sure. um, uh, but uh uh but basically you you lock onto the solar great emulation pattern or you lock onto a feature like a sunspot or a pore and that allow that gives you enough information uh, to you know, in nighttime you lock into point sources, right? And you you change things to keep the wavefront the same. But that's basically what you're locking on in the solar case for these extended. But, but you're locking on things that are changing very rapidly on their own. I mean, physically changing. Yeah. Well, the granulation has a time scale of about ten minutes. Sunspots uh -huh. last for 
long time. And if you have a rolling average, okay. right? Okay. Yes. And basically bootstrap it together and have a long time, uh, uh, you know, long time yeah. of, of stable seeing and adaptive optics corrected. Yeah. When I showed that image that I took from the Dunn Solar Telescope. There were a couple of times in that where there's, you know, atmospheric distortion and wobbling, and then it got really crazy. Some of those times was when we lost adaptive optic lock. Um, mm -hmm. That's because the Dunn Solar Telescope, its wavefront correction system, didn't have this rolling averaging process mm -hmm. uh, built into it. So the DKIS does. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I think we're pretty much at the top of the hour. We kind of hit our mark perfectly, I think. Uh, Lucas, uh, thank you so much for taking time out of your day on a Sunday in Hawaii. I'm sure there might be other things you could be doing. <laughs> well, we, we appreciate it. <laughs> You, we appreciate your time spending uh, spending it with us East Coasters. Um, I think it's 32 degrees right now, so but it's clear. So all of you with telescopes like John there in the background, we need to be seeing you out on the street right now. So um, thanks everyone for joining, and uh, of course uh, we'll see you on Valentine's Day for our next general meeting, and uh, and stay safe until then. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.